Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. In Capitalist Realism, discussing the band Nirvana, Mark Fisher wrote, Cobain seemed to give weary voice to the despondency of the generation that had come after history, whose every move was anticipated, tracked, bought and sold before it had even happened. And, uh, yeah, we live in late-stage capitalism. Our every move, even our supposedly counter-culture moves, are bought and sold before they even happen. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about punk and recuperation. Now, recuperation, for those who don't know, is, um, you know what, let's just ask Wikipedia. In the sociological sense, recuperation is the process by which politically radical ideas and images are twisted, co-opted, absorbed, diffused, incorporated, annexed, or commodified within media culture and bourgeois society, and thus become interpreted through a neutralized, innocuous, or more socially conventional perspective. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of sounds like that quote about Nirvana I just read, doesn't it? This is about everything from the punky Chips Ahoy oi 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 commercial, to that old commercial about how Subaru is punk rock, to that Nike commercial that Colin Kaepernick did, or using Macklemore's anti-consumerist song Wings in a Nike commercial, or how about that goddamn Pepsi commercial from a while back? That was a mess. This is about video games made by giant corporate capitalist companies selling you your dreams of being an anti-capitalist revolutionary. This is about video games that have punk clothing items like Tony Hawk or Saints Row, Infamous, Sunset Overdrive, GTA, or Stare Cats 2, or 3, or whatever. This is about Lady Gaga and Chris Brown and Kim Kardashian and... 21 and others wearing battle jackets. Has anti-capitalism itself been recuperated by capitalism? Now, perhaps you haven't noticed this, but I've made some references on this channel to, well, being punk. Punk and alternative culture. Radical folk punk songs. I purchased tickets to the Days and Days and Leftover Crack show, and I posted pictures to prove it. Punk though I am, I'm not blind to the recuperation of punk itself. I'll go ahead and drop my personal anecdotes about the punk scene. Jay Walkin Punk Anarchist. But what even is punk? Is it like this rebellious response to the status quo? Is it like just being against the mainstream? Jeffrey Lewis has a great song on the history of punk rock, which starts in the 1950s, and it's a cool and interesting song, but let's get a little bit more current than the 50s. If you saw Chill Goblin's video on the Sex Pistols and Chumbawamba, th then you learned that the Sex Pistols were kind of basically a fake invention, like punk was fake from the beginning, invented to sell clothes and all that, and that punk, as it's commonly understood, was an invented commodity. Even more than this, Chill Goblin argues that Chumbawamba was really punk and had punk cred because they were on the Crass record label. But the band Crass wrote a song called Punk Is Dead way back in 1978. So where does that leave us? It was probably two seconds after the first power chord was played through a dirty amplifier that someone first said, punk is dead. As early as 1978, socialist punk band The Clash had a song called White Man and Hammersmith Palais that, among other themes, laments punk rock being ruined by becoming too mainstream. Punk rockers in the UK, they won't notice anyway. They're all too busy fighting for a good place under the lighting. Now you may have heard punks talking about how left-wing punk is, how punk is anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-transphobic, pro-social and economic justice, and how Nazi punks are not real punks and should, in fact, fuck off. But how could a musical genre slash fashion aesthetic be tied to a spot on the political spectrum? Well, there are always exceptions. Johnny and Dee Dee Ramone, Johnny Rotten, Glenn Danzig, and a few others have proven that it is technically possible to wear safety pins, cut your hair into a mohawk, while simultaneously believing in trickle-down economics. 
It's not advice, but it is possible. But there are some key aspects of punk that push the genre as a whole to the left. Punk music and fashion are typically DIY and anti-consumerist. You don't need to spend a lot of money to dress punk, and you don't even really need to know how to play music to join a punk band. Punk is for the people, accessible to the working class and economically disenfranchised. Punk is also very concerned with authenticity. It's not good to be a poser. While this can lead to some pretty intense gatekeeping at times. Listen, you want to join our community garden? You better be a real punk. Name your top 10 favorite letters and Pat the Bunny's last name. Go! It also does a decent job at keeping the really right-wing punks out of the scene. Punk is an outsider art form, defining itself by what it's not. The mainstream, man. Punk is, if anything, anti-authority, pushing back against the status quo, whether that's the government, the police, corporations, or your parents telling you to clean your room. And surprisingly often, punk rebels against punk itself. <laughs> yeah, I guess punk just like actively hates itself, or is at least very self-critical. I've seen this time and time again. There was this local band called The Blanks who were known for two things. Their song, Punks Unite, which people liked, and that the lead singer yelled, fuck crust punks, while kicking a guy in the chest in the middle of one of their sets, which people didn't like. You have the crass song, Punk is Dead, which I already mentioned. You have bands like Apple, which is an acronym for all punks, please leave Earth. Common Enemy has a song, Punk is Dead, you're next. MDC's song, Poser Punk, Dead Kennedy's song, Anarchy for Sale, Autonomy's song, Dumb Punk, The Vandals' song, Anarchy Burger, Johnny Hobo's song, I'm So Punk, I Hate Punk, but I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's back up just a minute. In the high school I went to, like most high schools I assume, the swim team would shave their heads during the swimming season. And since they had to shave their heads anyway, they would always shave their hair into mohawks before the season started. And at this time, all my punk friends in high school, not wanting to be mistaken for swim team jocks or something, would all shave their mohawks off. Now, I thought that this was silly, even at the time, but I felt a similar sensation when Lady Gaga wore a studded leather jacket in one of her music videos, and then all of a sudden, all the stores in the mall were carrying combat boots and vests with spikes on them. When I went to the punk rock flea market, El Chapo in Ciudad de Mexico, they all had these pre-made punk jackets with like skulls and Jack Daniels back patches and stuff. And perhaps you've seen some of the ridiculous pre-made punk stuff that's on Wish or being made fun of on Reddit or something. Over time, this has just become more and more innocuous. As I mentioned earlier, you got punk clothes in Tony Hawk and Saints Row and as DLC in Staircats 2. Hell, you have Ted Cruz saying he likes Rage Against the Machine. Maybe conservatism is the new punk. Well, not quite. It seems like there's been a lot of effort to profit off of punk, to turn punk into a commodity. But really, outside of some video games or some celebrities wearing battle jackets, this hasn't really been successful. Right? Well now, hold on there, Rad. There is a notable exception to this. The pop punk era of the late 90s, early 2000s. Ah, pop punk. The only genre so at odds with itself that its own name is kind of an oxymoron. For a while there, pop punk was the biggest thing going. You couldn't turn on the radio, shop in a Walmart, or even enjoy the simple pleasure of watching a comedy movie about a teenager having sex with a pie without being bombarded by the na na na's of pop punk music. Suddenly, a thing that smelled a lot like counterculture was a part of the mainstream. The first punk band to really enter the mainstream was Green Day. Now, Green Day songs are fun, catchy, and definitely political. Singer Billy Joel Armstrong came out as bisexual on the song Basket Case. Uh, there's a song 99 Revolutions, which is about wealth inequality and the Occupy movement. And I have a sneaking suspicion that American Idiot might refer to George W. Bush. You could listen to Green Day for their politics, or you could just enjoy them as a kick-ass band to skateboard to. Or both. As pop punk became bigger and more marketable, it shed a lot of its left-wing political messages. That standard punk distrust of authority was still there in a way, although it was less about targeting the politicians or the rich and powerful than it was about targeting mean parents from the perspective of the children and teenagers listening to the songs. 
the enormously successful pop punk band Blink-182 mostly shied away from left-wing politics themselves, aside from saying, work sucks, I know, which I believe is a quote from Das Kapital. Let's take a look at some of Blink's most overtly political lyrics from their songs The Anthem and The Anthem Part 2. Let me just put on my whiniest voice for these. Okay. <clears throat> Corporate leaders, politicians, kids can't vote, adults elect them. Drown the youth with useless warnings. Teenage rules, they're fucking boring. To take this lyric completely seriously for a second, this is honestly not a bad take. I would personally love it if the voting age were lowered. But you can probably see how Blink-182 is less trying to make a serious critique of the system here than they are speaking directly to their target audience, which is to say, angsty teens in 2001 angry at their parents. Fuck you, Dad. At least you get to elect corporate leaders and politicians. Actually, son, I, I don't know how you think it works. I don't get to elect corporate leaders. That's kind of the whole problem. Have you read any Richard Wolf? Let me get you democracy at work. And another quote. Mom and dad possess the key. Instant slavery. So in this lyric, Blink compares living with your parents to the institution of slavery, which I'm just going to say it has not aged well. Now, just to be clear, I don't think that Blink-182 ever sat down in a boardroom by a bunch of shadowy elites and told never to speak out against the system. I don't think they were particularly interested in doing that from the beginning, some UFO theories aside. But I do think that it made them safe and marketable to the record industry that they were like no effects except apolitical, poppy, and handsome. And I also think it's really wild that it's harder to market a band that sings about anarchism than it is to market a band that sings about canine sodomy. But this is the world we live in. Yeah, I suppose you're right about the pop punk stuff. And hell, older punk stuff that's lost its edge with time falls into this category as well. Blink-182 and Ramones shirts at Walmart and stuff like that. But in the grand scheme of things, sure you see punk stuff in video games and music videos and like I said, Blink-182 and Ramones shirts at Walmart or the occasional spiked wristband or anarchy chain wallet at Hot Topic or whatever. But outside of all of this, I would argue that punk in general has largely not been commodified. Now I know I haven't exactly made the case for this yet, but for the sake of argument, let's ask, what is it about punk that makes it hard to recuperate? Well, if I had to guess, it's this thing called the DIY ethic, the do-it-yourself ethic of the punk scene. So what does DIY mean, outside of like something that rich people do on their HGTV TV shows or whatever. Well, the DIY ethic means that all aspects of the punk culture, or as much of it as possible, should be controlled by you, built with your bare paws. You want a shirt of that band you like? Make your own. Make your own patches and pins and stickers, you name it. You make it. I think contrasted against the hilarity of those commodified punk jackets and pants that you see online, it demonstrates what I mean here. Now, sure, throwing patches on one of your old jackets isn't the same as sewing a jacket from scratch. And in fact, honestly, I feel weird when people ask, did you make that jacket? And I have to go on this long explanation about how, yes, I cut out the stencils and I painted the patches and I sewed the patches on and all that, but no, I didn't sew the fabric of the jacket itself together. But I guess strangely, that's what people mean. Like, the jacket existing is a given, but customizing the jacket with patches and pins is making the jacket. In a way, this is even the DIY ethic refusing to be recuperated. Rather than being sold a consumer product, rather than being sold a punk jacket, I am questioning consumerism itself. I added patches to this jacket, but I didn't make the jacket. I'm being made aware that I didn't make it. I'm being made to ask, who did make this jacket? My first punk vest was made from one of my little sister's old denim jackets. And my first leather jacket was bought from angryyoungandpoor.com when I was in high school, but, but otherwise the jackets that I've made were from thrift stores. At first I bought all of my patches from various websites, again angryyoungandpoor.com for example, but it wasn't long before I was making stencils and patches myself. The DIY ethic puts the means of production somewhat in your own paws. 
What you have is unique to you. You made it yourself. It wasn't sold to you because it couldn't be sold to you. Making it is part of it. So, uh, so here's how it's done. First, you don't have a printer and it doesn't matter because ink is expensive. So instead you go to the library and use their printer. Oh wait, library's closed due to COVID. Okay, um, you Google your favorite band or political persuasion or whatever, followed by the word stencil. And if they don't have one, you can always make your own by messing with the threshold levels on Photoshop or whatever. Then you turn your laptop screen brightness all the way up and you trace the image onto a piece of paper. Then you use some kind of paste or glue to attach the picture to some cardboard. A manila folder works good for this because it gives you two pages worth of room for large stencils or some protection for smaller stencils. Then you put that under a heavy book for a few hours to dry. Then you take an old hardcover book you don't care too much about and get an X-Acto knife and cut out the stencil. You want to cut out the small parts first and work your way up because you want the stencil to have as much structural integrity as possible while you cut it out. Then you grab your thrift store pants. Oh, wait, I didn't mention that part yet. Um, a great place for cheap patch material is go to the thrift store and grab a pair of jeans of your preferred color. You can usually get these pretty cheap since you aren't really looking for any preferred size or cut of pants. Okay, back to the stencil. There are a couple different ways to do this. Either you use a broad brush or a sponge to go over the stencil that way, or you can use spray paint, or you can use spray paint and then do it over once painting by paw. The reason you might want to do this is that if you want to go with that classic black patch with white paint look, then well, white spray paint is thin and doesn't really cover well, so you might want to go over once painting by paw, so the color sticks out. Okay, now you let the patch dry, and then you want to cut it out if you haven't cut it out already, leaving some room to fold the patch over so it doesn't fray. Then you take some floss, it's a good source for cheap and sturdy thread, and acts as a nice contrast with the black fabric. Put the floss one and a half times around the patch to give yourself a good amount of thread to use, Put the thread through the needle, tie the two ends together, fold your patch over to avoid fraying, sew the patch into place, and wow, look at that. Looks awesome. Recuperation be damned. But the DIY ethic isn't just about clothes. You can cut and dye your own hair, give yourself tattoos. You wanna make a comic? Start your own zine. You wanna learn an instrument? Get one. Start a band with some friends. Can't get signed to a record label? No need. Maybe burn a bunch of CDs with your music on it, or throw it all up on Bandcamp or YouTube or whatever. Maybe there's some dive bars or all-ages venues for you to take your... Or, well, I guess maybe not during COVID. Um, maybe you could do house shows? You want band merch? Make some. Any aspect of the punk culture can be taken under your control. You know, ownership of the means of production, if you will. And over the last few years, I guess by few I mean 15 years or so, a subgenre of punk has emerged that brings this DIY ethic to the next level. And we'll scream up the punks until our throats are dry. And tomorrow we'll scream DIY or cry. So I suppose some subgenres of punk have managed to be recuperated by capitalism more than others. Casualties, t shirts at Hot Topic. Ramones and Blink-182 shirts at Walmart or whatever, as already explained. But on the other side of this divide, we have folk punk. Now, I think this all started with some of the political folk artists like Billy Bragg or David Ravix or whatever back in the day. But then in the early 2000s, folk punk started in earnest, with bands like Mischief Brew, Johnny Hobo, Ryan Harvey, Planet X Records, blah 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 blah, all through the Bush years, popularized by the anti-Iraq war movement and such. And then it really started taking off during the Occupy movement and the Obama years, paralleling the rise of popular indie folk stuff like Mumford & Sons or whatever. And you know what? You know that these bands are punk because they have anti-punk songs, maintaining that self-critique style. Mischief Brew's Bury Me in Analog, Johnny Hobo's song I'm So Punk I Hate Punk, Days and Days's Goodbye Lulu, David Ravix's I'm a Better Anarchist Than You, Man Tits's Ode to Freedom, and so on. Now, in recent years, folk punk has faltered. It's become kind of stale. I mean, it's like a 20 plus year old genre at this point. As John Worm said in our interview, 
it's uh, it's almost a joke i mean like folk punk is like really it's it's a meme at this point it's like you know it's the possum screaming at his own ass like that's that's folk punk and i tend to agree oh i actually have a, a couple vinyls of that possum screaming into its own ass early stuff really really good i did stop listening after i heard possum ass screams in that pepsi commercial sold out <laughs> Now, this might not be relevant to too many folks, uh, but please just indulge me. It used to be, in the Bush years, you couldn't listen to any two songs by any folk punk band, Mischief Brew, Casual Terrorist, This Bike is a Pipe Bomb, or whatever, without at least one of those songs being obviously and explicitly political. Nowadays, though, you can scroll through the stuff posted to Fistful of Vinyl, Shibby Pictures, or Punk with a Camera, or r slash folk punk or whatever and you'll see a lot of apolitical songs about drug addiction and broken hearts it's like they're all johnny hobo and days and days knockoffs but they only listen to whiskey is my kind of lullaby and misanthropic drunken loner but never listen to perdon in manhattan or bible pages now this might not mean a lot for those who aren't familiar with the genre but i had a sort of crisis of self a political self-critique moment if you will back in 2016. Thinking about the recent death of Eric Peterson, the lead singer of Mischief Brew, one of the original folk punk bands from the time when the genre was much more explicitly political, and I was just feeling very defeated about the whole thing. But you know what? One day, I was listening to Wake Up by Pat the Bunny, and I remembered, you know what? All is not lost. For one, the anti-capitalist DIY ethic is alive and well all through the punk scene, and there are plenty of active political folk punk bands. Ludlow, Bo Solo, One Man Left, and Matt Pless come to mind, and many who aren't explicitly political have quite a few political songs. And you know what? I've seen quite a few punks throwing their music up on TikTok and stuff like that as well. Pretty cool. To my knowledge, none of this has been recuperated. Perhaps Fisher was wrong. Maybe with the DIY ethic, our every move can't be anticipated, can't be tracked, can't be bought and sold. And if you want something, you've got to do it yourself. If you want something, you've got to do it yourself. Don't sacrifice work for subliminal help. If you want something, you've got to do it yourself. Folk punk has evolved and changed a lot in its 20 plus years of relevance. I mean, it's not like crass fans were listening to the Fugs or whatever. So what's next? So what is the shape of punk to come? Well, hopefully it's a little bit more punk 1977 and a little bit less cyberpunk 2077. You get points for turning people into the police, what? For DIY, anti-consumerism, uh, lifting up the voices of the outsiders. It's hard to think of a better tool for punks than the internet. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, file sharing, MP3s let people share music without a loss in quality. Online forums let punks come together and discuss music and have political discussions and build a sense of community with punks around the world. Uh, I just thought I would explain how the World Wide Web works, in case anyone's unfamiliar. A punk has always had a split personality within the mainstream and the underground. And with the internet, that underground can go a lot further. The internet has made that underground side of punk accessible to people who had never experienced it before. Instead of having to dig through the racks at punk record stores to find those rare albums or send a literal letter in the mail to get a CD back from that certain band, if you're looking for any punk band ever recorded, you can probably find it on the internet. Just try YouTube, it's probably here. A lot of aspects of punk have already merged with hip-hop, with acts like JPEG Mafia, Rico Nasty, and Death Grips channeling some of that punk energy in their music. And the echoes of pop punk and emo can be heard in a lot of SoundCloud rap, from Lil Peep to Rez Coast Grizz, who were and are doing things with his genres that I've never heard before. There is just a lot of incidental crossover between punk and hip-hop to begin with. I mean, they're both outsider genres that crossed over into the mainstream, hip-hop with a little bit more success than punk, I will admit. They are both very concerned with authenticity of their artists. They're both very political and conscious sometimes. And who could forget how much they both hate cops. So I would expect to see a lot more crossover between the two genres going forward. 
at the end of the day, punk is less about electric guitars and drums and more about just doing whatever you want. You know, punk is about subverting the norms, and when the norms lead to a world as fucked up as this, the norms are more worthy of being subverted than ever. You know, I mean, I think and hope and wish that punk will always have a place. Yeah, true, true. Hip hop and punk crossover itself has an interesting history. Ice T starting the band Body Count back in the 90s, Boots Riley starting the band Street Sweeper Social Club in the early 2000s, and the various punk rap and trap metal groups of today. Whatever the future holds, some fusion of techno, metal, ska, folk punk, trap rap, whatever, so long as folks keep taking the production into their own paws, throwing out their songs on TikTok or YouTube or Bandcamp or whatever, folks making their own CDs and comics and patches and vests and jackets and whatever, so long as the DIY ethic remains, I think punk will remain impossible to recuperate. So I guess with all that said, go to your local thrift store, get a denim jacket, maybe tear the sleeves off. If your favorite band or a political affiliation has patches for sale online, you could buy some, maybe make your own patches. Get yourself an old beat of guitar or a drum set or bagpipes or saxophone or ukulele or banjo or tap dancing shoes. And learn a few beats or chords and then just get your friends together and make some music, okay? Hey government, I don't like the things you do. I don't like the things you try to do. I especially don't like the things that you don't do. That was a punk song, technically. Not a good one, but that was one. Yeah, exactly. Get to it. Um, I guess that's it, folks. Uh, thank you, my wonderful patrons, for your support. Thank you, Chill Goblin, for hopping on to discuss punk and recuperation with me. And um, you, dear viewer, if you want to see more about politics and punk and such, I threw some links to some relevant Chill Goblin videos in the description, so you should go check those out. Um, but yeah, that's it. Go do some DIY stuff. Go, go. Go do it. <laughs> Y'all remember that show Zoom when they would show you how to do something and then you were supposed to turn off your TV and go do it? I almost never turned off my TV, but, but that was me. You, you have to be better than me and, and go and do stuff. Go and create stuff, okay? Uh, bye. You know what really makes us mad? Is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah, tell them about punk. Yeah, we got this CD called Punk. It's loaded with our favorite tunes, man.